Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Dr. Olean Adams, who is our um, who's our our host today, our lecturer, our speaker. It's Dr. Olean Adams. Olean is a board certified practitioner of family medicine and practices holistic medicine at Southern Coos Hospital in Bandon, Oregon. He uses traditional osteopathic medicine when caring for his patients in the clinic, in the hospital, and in the emergency room. He's a faculty member of the Biodynamics of Osteopathy program and lectures internationally teaching osteopathic medicine to physicians from around the world. He is a faculty member of the Biodynamics of Osteopathy program, which I just said, and he synthesizes the principles of Ayurvedic medicine and osteopathic medicine to provide a deeper understanding of physiology, spirituality, and the wholeness of life as it pertains to health, healing, and well being. So I'll hand it over to Olin to start us off with a prayer and, and launch us into his talk. Let us close our eyes for a moment and think of God and gurus and think of the spiritual masters who have brought forth the wisdom of Ayurvedic medicine and osteopathic medicine for the benefit of all mankind. Let us come to a deeper understanding of these sacred teachings and these sacred principles for the benefit of all mankind and our all around development. Om. Amen. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you all through Zoom. It would be nice to see you in person, your bright, shiny faces and bright eyes. It's a pleasure to spend a little time with you. This is the first talk in a uh, series of talks that are sponsored by the Pranada uh, Wellness Center. And the Pranada Wellness Center is a uh, new initiative started uh, by Kriya Yoga Institute and will be headquartered at the uh, Temple of Compassion in Texas. The Pranada Wellness Center uh, has been blessed and uh, named by Paramahansa Pragyanandaji, Guruji, and he named the wellness center Pranada. Uh, Pranada means uh, giver of prana, that which gives prana. And prana, uh, it has uh, many meanings. If you look up the Sanskrit translation of the word prana, all of the meanings center around a common principle or a common theme. Some of the translations you'll see are uh, breath, um, spirit, vital force, life force, uh, breath of life. And uh, in osteopathic medicine, we acknowledge the breath of life as one of the essential principles uh, to medicine and to care of the, of the sick and in wellness. And it's also an essential principle in, in Ayurvedic medicine. So both of these systems of medicine recognize an essential principle, that of uh, prana, of life force, of a breath of life that's creating and sustaining everything. And these principles are essential to the practice of a holistic care of medicine. Because when we talk about holistic medicine, we're talking about a movement to wholeness. Healing is a movement back to our original form, our original state of wholeness. So we have to include the breath of life 
which is sustaining, creating, and destroying everything. And so we include destroying as part of the creative process of life. And these three principles have to be in balance. <clears throat> so in our physiology, there has to be a balance between creation, sustaining, and destroying. If you look at the bones, for example, there are uh, osteoblasts and osteoclasts, and they have to be in balance. The osteoblasts create bones, the osteoclasts destroy bone, and these two need to be in balance all of the time to uh, maintain a healthy bone that's being constantly recreated. And this is coming from the breath of life. So this first conversation, this first uh, talk is sponsored by Pranada Wellness Center. And it is uh, to be a talk about the immune system. I believe the title of our talk is uh, self-care, the immune system and the uh, cave of Brahman. Did I get that right, Rosa? Rosa's our host. <laughs> that's, that's right, yep. Okay. So we're here to talk about self-care and the immune system. The immune system is a really, really beautiful system, which is primarily a perceptual function. If you were to study the science of the immune system, which is a beautiful study, they would have you believe it's purely a biochemical event. It's just biochemistry, but actually it's a perceptual event. It's all based on perception and it's the perception, it's the heart of the immune system, it's the perception that's driving and influencing and affecting the biochemistry. The immune system is based on a perception of wholeness. So its function is based and perceives only wholeness. Every cell, every tissue, every structure has its own immune system, but it's all tied into a single unified whole that's perceived only as whole. So it's everywhere. There's no place that the immune system isn't. <clears throat> the other thing that the immune system needs to function properly is a reference point of the perfect. So it actually is an essential truth that inside of each and every individual, there's perfection. And we recognize that when we uh, bow to one another, when we say namaste, I recognize the perfection in the divinity within you. That's an essential truth for the immune system to function properly, and it's a scientific fact. If you uh, look at what happens, for example, when you cut your hand, you cut your hand, there's some bleeding. After the bleeding stops, there's a process that starts that we call healing. And the hand, the wound, heals back to perfection. It doesn't heal part way and stop and say, oh, that's good enough. It doesn't heal too far and grow a whole new hand. It actually heals back to perfection, back to its original wholeness, back to its original form. So what that tells us, if we think about that a little bit, is there's something inside of us that recognizes perfection. There's something inside of us that is perfect. And there's something that recognizes when we've moved away from that perfection and when we need to move back to the perfection. There's this innate intelligence inside of us 
that we call the immune system. And it functions perceptually off of the principle of wholeness. It only recognizes one. It recognizes multiplicity and diversity, but it recognizes and responds to it as if it was all one. So the immune system responds to divine love and wholeness. Now, the problem that modern science has had in understanding the immune system more completely is they can't find this one that recognizes the wholeness. They can't find the fulcrum that organizes all of this function because they don't want to acknowledge and admit that there's a soul, that there's something perfect indwelling in the human form. And you can't separate the body, the mind, and the spirit. They're one function. <clears throat> the science tries to study just the biochemistry, but we need to acknowledge that there's something behind the biochemistry. There's an intelligence and a love that is unifying it, that understands it, that creates it, and maintains it. And that is the heart of the immune system. Now, science is beginning to catch up a little bit on what the saints, sages, the rishis, and the seers have been saying and telling us for thousands and thousands of years, that there is a central point within the body that organizes all of this intelligence in this immune system. And it's called the third ventricle. In the spiritual writings, it's called the cave of Brahman. So inside the center of the brain is a very, very sacred and special place. Science calls it the third ventricle. Spiritual writings call it the cave of Brahman. We're gonna take a little look at the embryological development of the immune system, of the third ventricle, at the cave of Brahman, which hopefully will give us a little better understanding of how the immune system works, how it perceives wholeness, and how it functions. This, this fundamental understanding will then give us the principles that we use to take care of the immune system. So rather than just tell you a bunch of facts and data points of do this or do that, take this, take that, we try to understand at a deeper level what this immune system is, how it functions. The most important point to understand of the immune system is that it's a function of perception. The immune system is everywhere. There's no place in your body that there's not an immune system functioning. So let's take a look at this. If Rosa could put up uh, slide two for us. Slide two, there we go. There we have a, a, a beautiful embryo developing. And we're going to look at the embryology of the development of the immune system and the central nervous system. What I really like about this picture is one, the transparency. This embryo is transparent to life. It's transparent to prana, to the breath of life. And it only responds to one thing, that's the breath of life, the, in, the love as it incarnates, is driving the growth and development of this form. Rosa can take the pointer and show the uh, little area in the middle is the heart. And those cells that formed the heart were originally at the top of the head. She can point the arrow to the very top at the crown chakra, 
there was a group of cells called the angiogenetic cluster. And the first big movement that the embryo did when it was growing and developing is it bowed. It bowed down. And when it raised back up, it left those cells behind. And those cells formed the heart. So from our earliest, earliest stages of growth and development, there's a deep connection between the mind and the heart. There's a deep connection to bowing. Bowing is an essential function to the health and integrity of the immune system and the central nervous system. Let's go to the next slide. So here we have a little bit more detailed picture of what we're talking about in the third ventricle, the cave of Brahman. On the left, we have the brain looking from the side view. And the dark area in the middle is deep inside the brain. That's the lateral ventricle and the third ventricle. And the picture on the right is a detail of that dark area. It's the third ventricle and the lateral ventricles. Now, the way that this is formed is very interesting. It starts out as a tube. So a tube is formed. And at one end of the tube, we're going to have the bottom of the spinal cord. And at the top end of the tube, we're going to have that third ventricle. So that third ventricle is the top of a tube. And initially, it's just a tube. And it's misnamed because the third ventricle was named by anatomists, not embryologists. That third ventricle is actually the first ventricle because it's the starting point of the whole of creation in the embryo. The whole of the human form is starting in that point of the third ventricle. Off of the third ventricle, then the lateral ventricles arise. The eyes, <laughs> come off the side of the ventricles and move forward. And they pick up every layer of the brain as they come forward. Every layer of the central nervous system is picked up and the eyes are formed. And then the front of the ventricle there is called lamina terminalis. And that's a very, very important point for the immune system and perception. It's a transparent, membrane that is sensitive to the blood chemistries and to the entire physiology can be picked up through that area. It's transparent to light. It's transparent to created and uncreated light. And it's monitoring and registering, paying attention to and finding everything that's going on in the entire physiology. So there's an observer inside of that space that's monitoring, registering every single thing that's going on inside of your physiology. On the back side of that third ventricle is the pineal gland. If you read uh, Paramahansa Hari Harananda's uh, books, uh, Ocean of Divine Bliss, he talks a lot about the pineal gland and the pituitary gland, which is down below the third ventricle there, as being important points for the yogi to allow their consciousness to rest. This whole complex then <clears throat> makes up um, what we call the cave of Brahman. It's a very sacred space and it is uh, filled with cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebral spinal fluid is a, is a sacred substance. Dr. Still, the founder of osteopathy, said the cerebral spinal fluid was the highest known substance. 
it's a form of ojas in ayurvedic medicine there's ojas which is part of the immune system ojas is the essence of the kapha dosha and it's the essence of the immune system and so part of these ojas part of this sacred fluid is in this ventricular system in the third ventricle and it gets dispersed throughout the whole body through a process called <clears throat> neurotrophic flow. So <clears throat> how does this work in the immune system? We can take the pictures down for a moment. <clears throat> how does this work in the immune system? There's all types of immune cells <clears throat> floating around in your circulation, in your lymphatics, in your bloodstream, and they're picking up all kinds of information. They have fancy names, uh, natural killer cells, macrophages, all kinds of fancy names. It's just suffice to know that there's these cells that are floating around all over the body, and they're picking up different information. Some of them are called antigen presenting cells. So they're gathering information based on what they come in contact with throughout the body. Those cells then bring that information up into the lamina terminalis that we saw, into the third ventricle. The third ventricle then processes that information and makes a decision. It has to recognize self, non-self. So as we said, it's a perceptual phenomenon. This is all about perception. So there's a perception of self, non-self. If non-self is perceived or a threat is perceived or something that is going to disrupt the integrity of the wholeness, a signal is created and a fire, an ignition occurs in the third ventricle. In Ayurveda, they would say Tejas is activated. The fire is created and it's a fever. We call it fever. So this heat, this fire, this flame is created in the third ventricle and it's dispersed out through the whole body through a process called neurotrophic flow. So now you have these nerve, these through the prana, you have this information being carried out and dispersed through the whole body and these nerve endings go to every cell, every lymphatic system, every lymphatic vessel gets awakened, gets activated, gets put on notice that there's a problem and we need to do something about it. And that's called a fever or a febrile response. So this information gets distributed to the entire body all of the lymphatics, <clears throat> all of the, every cell, every cell in the whole body receives this information. This coming from a central point inside of the third ventricle, inside the cave of Brahman. Inside of the cave of Brahman is a central intelligence, a profound loving intelligence that's aware of the whole and only relates to the whole. And so we end up with this immune response. You can get fever, you can get activation of the uh, cells, white cells get activated, immune cells get activated and they start to move about the whole body and they go to the area of trouble and they bring balance, they restore the balance. They bring the bacteria into balance, they bring the viruses into balance. They transmutate one form of energy into another through a process of transmutation that occurs through fire. <clears throat> So that's a little bit about the way that the immune system works, both from a biochemical standpoint, 
in a perceptual standpoint. And uh, science is really starting to catch up with this. There's a whole new branch of science about the immune system called the neuroendocrine immune connection. So they're starting to recognize that it's not just an immune system, but it includes the endocrine system, the nervous system, and really the entire, uh, the entire body, the entire, you, you can't separate the immune system from any other part. It's, it's all one. Every cell recognizes the immune system. Every cell has its own immune system. They're also starting to recognize that this third ventricle is really, really important and key to the whole process because they're finding when there's problems or lesions in the third ventricle, the whole immune system shuts down. So the science is actually catching up to what the saints, sages, and rishis have been telling us for thousands and thousands and thousands of years this cave of Brahman. Let's look um, briefly at slide four, Rosa. <clears throat> so this is an important slide because it reminds us that the function of anything is bigger than the form or the structure. On the right side, we see the cave of Brahman, the third ventricle. And on the left side, we see the, the function of the, of the cave of Brahman. So right side shows the anatomy, left side shows the function. And what I mean by that is when the soul, which is the function, inhabits the body. The function supersedes the anatomy. So the function is much, much, much bigger than the anatomy. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean, because that's, that's a big concept, and it's an important concept, especially when it pertains to the immune system. <clears throat> if you look at the heart, the structure, the anatomy of the heart is about the size of, of your fist. <clears throat> so it, uh, it's sitting in the middle of the chest, and it occupies a small space. But its function actually includes the whole body because as the heart pumps and the blood flows, it's flowing through the whole entire body. So the function of the heart is much, much, much bigger than the structure. We could take another example of the pancreas. The pancreas secretes insulin. It's a small structure in the abdomen but its function is every cell in the body because every cell has to receive insulin to allow the sugar to come in to keep it fed, alive, and healthy. We could broaden it out to our eyes. The eyes are a very, very small structure, but its function goes all the way to the horizon. Our eyes are made to see all the way to the horizon. And the prana that's carrying the information from the horizon to the eyes then transports that information all the way to the back of the brain. So the function of the eyes actually includes the whole head all the way to the horizon. So function is always bigger than structure. And that's especially important when we talk about the cave of Brahman, the third ventricle, the seat of the immune system. If you look at the anatomy on the right of this picture, it's a small space inside the brain. But its function is huge. And 
when a yogi through deep meditation goes into meditation and enters the cave of Brahman, they experience this. The yogi experiences this cave of Brahman as infinite space, infinite space. So the gurus, the teachers have taught us to allow our consciousness to rest inside the cave of Brahman to rest. They say, put your attention in the cave of Brahman. Put your attention in the pituitary or the pineal or the fontanelle. Now, the attention is prana moving. But when the prana comes to rest, it's consciousness. So we use our attention to move into the cave of Brahman, but then we come to rest. And when we come to rest, it becomes consciousness. And the consciousness then activates the function. And the function then becomes a huge, infinite space. So sometimes we get hung up thinking, how am I going to fit my consciousness inside this little space that they're calling the cave of Brahman, which is the third ventricle? How am I going to fit inside this little space? It's actually an infinite space because it's the function that we're relating to, not the structure. We're not the body. We inhabit the body. We take care of the body. But we're the formless consciousness. And when we rest inside of this cave of Brahman, it's activated, it's awakened, it's opened, and it becomes infinite space. And this actually improves the entire immune function. So the, the space of the immune system, the function of the immune system at a minimum at a minimum, is from the center of the third ventricle to the horizon. At a minimum. It's actually much, much more. But for now, we'll say it's from the center of the third ventricle to the horizon as a perceptual experience. What does that mean? That means your immune system, when functioning properly, is aware of the cell phone tower on the horizon. Your immune system, when functioning properly, is aware of the quality of the air that's coming off of the horizon. Your immune system is aware of the quality of the water that's running through the rivers, the quality of the water that's in your, in your city's water supply. And it's making subtle adjustments in your physiology all the time. It's accounting for all of these things. It's accounting for electromagnetic frequencies coming from cell phone towers. It's accounting for pollution coming off of the horizon. It's accounting for the quality of the water. It's accounting for the weather changes. Your immune system is aware of the suffering of your neighbor. It's aware of everything from the center of you to the horizon at a minimum. So when you help your neighbor's suffering, you're helping their immune system and your own immune system. Because your immune system functions off of the perception of wholeness. It's the only way it can function. It doesn't function in parts. It only recognizes wholeness. And that includes the entire horizon. It actually includes much, much more, but our understanding of wholeness grows and evolves. We could think about the big toe, and then we could think about the whole foot, and then we could think about the whole leg, then we could think about the whole person, then we could think about the whole environment. So our understanding of wholeness is ever expanding and growing to, until it includes the whole at which point there's no words. There's only a perceptual experience of the breath of life passing through everything, creating, sustaining, and destroying everything.
as one event. And the breath of life is fundamental to the immune system. It creates it, it sustains it, and it gives the perception and it's passing through the third ventricle all the time, creating and sustaining. That's one of the ways osteopathic physicians treat the immune system is by synchronizing with this breath of life as it's passing through the third ventricle in a, in a approach that we call osteopathy in the cranial field. It's one of the reasons that there are some of the therapies of uh, Ayurvedic medicine are so beneficial. Shiradhara, for example, the pouring of warm medicated oil across the forehead, right across the doorway to the third ventricle, brings a soothing effect to the entire cave of Brahman. It pacifies the vata dosha. It removes the uh, toxins and the ama that has accumulated in and around this area. And it brings the prana to rest inside of the third ventricle, this rhythmic therapeutic movement of the oil as it crosses the forehead, gently rocking the fluids to a nice subtle stillness and the prana comes to rest. And when the prana is at rest, it's consciousness. And when the consciousness is present, it activates the function. It enhances the function. It optimizes the function. So having a little bit of understanding of the physiology and the embryology behind the immune system can allow us to come to an understanding of the principles that will care for the immune system, that will support the immune system. Because supporting the immune system, it's not about taking a bunch of supplements. It's about a support of the wholeness. It's about a perceptual function. Now, sure, supplements and herbs can be very beneficial, but they're not gonna work so well if we don't have the integrity of the basic function. <clears throat> we can take that picture down. Thank you, Rosa. So if we consider what we've talked about, that the immune system is a function of perception and the function is bigger than the form or the structure. And the immune system is everywhere then we could ask ourselves, what does the immune system need to function optimally? What does it really need? Now we could talk about some herbs and supplements, which we will as we go along, but there are things that are even more important than any supplement you could give or take. One of the most important things that the immune system needs is silence. Now, what does that mean? Well, the walls of this third ventricle, the walls of this cave of Brahman, the sidewalls are called thalamic nuclei. 
And it's a processing center where nearly every single neuronal input comes into, is processed and then distributed throughout the rest of the central nervous system and the brain. So all of the prana is moving to the walls of the cave of Brahman to be processed, interpreted, and then dispersed in its proper functions. For that process to happen optimally, there needs to be a silence inside the cave and it's inherent. But what happens is we get into a frenzy lifestyle. We get moving too quickly. We get under stress. And we get more and more synaptic noise coming into the thalamic nuclei. We get more and more prana agitated and flowing through the thalamic nuclei surrounding the cave of Brahman, causing all kinds of noise and distraction, making it more and more difficult for the function to function optimally. So you could say when vata dosha is vitiated and agitated, it begins to then disperse throughout the body. And one of the places that it has to go is to the lateral walls of the third ventricle. It has to pass through the edges of the cave of Brahman just based on how the physiology is set up. Silence and rest are essential to the normal function of the immune system. Now, when do we get silence? Well, we can get silence in deep meditation. The silence is actually already there. Inside of the cave of Brahman is a deep, deep silence and stillness. And if we acknowledge that, and listen to it, will activate the function of silence that's essential to the normal function of the immune system. We also get silence in deep sleep so sleep and rest is essential to the normal function of the immune system. That's deep sleep, not dream state. The problem is we're often under so much stress that we have to go through a dream stage before we get to deep sleep stage to process all of the unconscious and suppressed thoughts and emotions that we've accumulated through the day, the week. So that's another reason meditation is so beneficial to the immune system because we're processing those unconscious thoughts. Those unconscious emotions are coming to the surface to be digested and processed. So when we lay down to sleep, we can go into deep sleep state more quickly. In deep sleep, there's silence. The immune system has a certain pace and tempo that's naturally inherent. So we're pausing right now, not because I've forgotten what to say,
but because there's a pace and tempo to life. And when we follow the breath of life and the pace and the tempo that it's giving, it'll support the immune system. So we need a little time sometimes to have a pause, to rest, digest, to integrate. And this is built into life. We just miss the opportunities to pause. But pauses happen all the time. And we get impatient. And we try to push through the pause. We push the tempo of life. The breath of life is bringing a certain tempo all the time. And sometimes it stops. Sometimes the prana just comes to rest. You mostly notice it when you're out in nature. If you're out walking, sometimes you'll notice all the animals stop. The circadians, the crickets, the mosquitoes, everything just comes to a stop comes to a pause. That's the natural world <clears throat> resetting itself, coming to a pause, recognizing the perfection, and then moving forward. So if we can recognize these pauses, and pause and stop when there's a natural pause, it actually supports the immune system. <clears throat> now, Ayurvedic medicine, osteopathic medicine, are all about the natural laws of healing. So it's our job as practitioners and physicians to understand the natural world and the supernatural world. Because we're trying to find the health in the patient. It's there in everyone. Doctor Still said anyone can find disease. The true physician finds the health. So the true physician is seeking to uncover something perfect and something beautiful in each and every person. And we find that by studying the natural laws of healing, and one of those laws is there are pauses, still points, in moments where we take just to stop, reset, and integrate. It doesn't always take long. Sometimes the pause is 30 seconds. But if we bring the consciousness to the pause, that activates the function. When we bring our consciousness to any function, it's activated and it becomes stronger, becomes more powerful and has the capacity to change. So the immune system, it needs silence, it needs rest, it needs pauses, and it needs love. The immune system really only responds to love. It is a function of love. That love could be anything, anything that you love. If you acknowledge it, you're supporting your immune system. It can be love for the true self. It can be love for your breath. It can be love for prana, consciousness, Krishna prana, anything you love your wife, your spouse, your husband, your guru, your spiritual practice, your neighbor. It's essential. It's essential to recognize what you love. The immune system, this is the food of the immune system. The most important food. We'll talk about the physical food probably at our next meeting because this, this talk 
was designed to be in two parts because it's such a big topic, the immune system and self-care of the immune system. So we can talk about the food, the physical food, and the 30-day digestion process of the gross and subtle digestion and how to feed the nervous system and the, and the immune system. But prior to all that, and more basic to all of that, is this principle of love as the essential food and the biggest anti-inflammatory. Love is the most potent anti-inflammatory <clears throat> that there is. So we have silence, we have rest, we have pauses, we have love, <clears throat> are all essential to the immune system. What else is essential to the immune system? Well, the breath. The breath is essential to the immune system. There's actually two breaths. There's one breath that is mechanical in nature called thoracic respiration. And there's another breath, which is the breath of life. It's more subtle, but it's flowing all the time and passing through everything. And when it passes through the physiology, we can actually feel it breathing, inhalation and exhalation, expansion and contraction of the whole organism through the fluids can be felt by osteopathic physicians. There's this cellular breathing that's much, much slower than thoracic respiration. It can breathe at two to three breaths per minute, which is actually a fast breath for that. So every 30 seconds, there's an inhalation and exhalation that can be felt. It can also be felt at a much slower rate taking about 100, 120 seconds for inhalation and exhalation. This is a cellular respiration that osteopathic physicians call primary respiration. And it's the basis for osteopathy in the cranial field. There are therapies such as cranial sacral therapy that have uh, adapted some of those ideas in working with the fluctuations of the cerebral spinal fluid, which is a response to this cellular breathing, this primary respiration. But there's also a thoracic respiration, <clears throat> which is essential to the immune system in many ways. Thoracic respiration uh, pumps the immune system. It pumps the lymphatic flow, the movement of the diaphragm actually creates a movement of all of the lymphatics. All of the lymphatic fluid is moved through thoracic respiration. The thoracic respiration also has a direct effect on the prana, on the flow of the vital force. There's actually five pranas. <clears throat> We start with one prana, they develop and differentiate into five, and they each have their own function. But they should function off of one single fulcrum, one single idea. And when our breath is harmonized, when our thoracic respiration is harmonized, it brings a harmonization process to the five pranas, which has a profound effect on the immune system we talked a little bit about that and the effect that it has on the lateral ventricles and the walls in the cave of Brahman. So thoracic respiration in a good, healthy, normal breath is essential to the immune system. So we often hear about a normal conscious breath. Well, what, what is a normal conscious breath? What would a normal breath be? 
because our job as physicians, our job as practitioners, our job as yogis and practitioners of yoga is to find the normal. Our normal state is what we're seeking. <clears throat> normal is extraordinary. In our normal state, as we're told in the scriptures, is Sat Chit Ananda, existence, consciousness, and bliss. So the entire journey of health and healing is to uncover and live in what is normal. So if we're going to talk about a normal conscious breath, both in meditation and in supporting the immune system, we have to ask ourselves, what is a normal conscious breath? What is a normal breath? Well, inside of thoracic respiration is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful process. And there's this beautiful substance that we talked about called ojas, which is the essence of the kapha dosha. It's the essence of the immune system. It's inside of the cerebral spinal fluid. And Ayurvedic medicine tells us there's eight drops of ojas inside the heart. If you get more, you have trouble. If you get less, you have trouble. Eight drops is the perfect number. This ojas represents the cellular intelligence. And we already know that inside of the third ventricle, there's a monitoring system for the entire physiology inside of the blood, inside of the blood chemistry is constantly being monitored, watched and evaluated. So when the ojas and the cellular intelligence perceives that more oxygen is needed inside of the blood, it sends a signal via the prana, it sends a signal to the prana, to the prana vayu. And the prana vayu, vayana vayu, expands out. That's its nature. That's the movement. It's an expansive nature. <clears throat> so you get this opening. This is before the air even has flowed. There's no flow of air yet. We're talking about the first step of a normal breath. The first step is your cellular intelligence has recognized it needs a little more oxygen. It sends a signal via prana to pranavayu, which creates an opening. An opening can be felt in the lower abdomen and the pelvis. So before you even take a breath, there's this opening. And as you get more attuned to the subtle flow of prana through meditation, in Kriya Yoga, we're taught to feel divine, uh, the divine light, divine sound, and divine vibration. As we get more attuned to this divine vibration, you can actually feel this opening. So this opening happens, and it creates a space. And that space then allows the diaphragm to move down. So the diaphragm moves down into the space. When the diaphragm moves down, it creates more space in the lungs, which creates a vacuum, which allows the air to flow in. So if we notice our breath, if we notice a normal conscious breath, as the air flows in, you may feel a stop point. You feel like you're breathing in and the air stops somewhere, the prana stops somewhere. Now a normal breath, actually that doesn't happen. It moves seamlessly. 
all the way down to the abdomen and pelvis. But sometimes when we're breathing in, we feel a stop point somewhere around the diaphragm. That's because the prana isn't harmonized. So there is excess prana at the seam of the diaphragm. <clears throat> Ayurvedic medicine teaches that when there is excess of a dosha, the dosha will circulate and deposit in the empty spaces. That's what will lead to disease and imbalance. One of the empty spaces in the body is above and below the diaphragm. We could put up picture six, I think, Rosa, and it might help. So here on the left side, we have a front to back view of the chest and diaphragm with the ribs and uh, visceral organs removed. And we see the flat shaped diaphragm and above the diaphragm, between the diaphragm and the lungs, there's a little space there. That space was large in the embryo. It's very small in the adult. But remember, the function is bigger than the space. So there is a functional space there. And if you get an excess vata dosha from stress, PTSD, nervousness, anxiety, bad food, you have a sympathetic dominant state. It's called PTSD or anxiety. So that sympathetic dominant state, that excess nerve energy has to be dispersed somewhere in the body. The body's not gonna send it to the brain or brainstem because you'll get a seizure. So it's gonna try to send it to safe places. It's gonna send it to these empty spaces. There's an empty space between the diaphragm and the lungs and another empty space underneath the diaphragm, between the diaphragm and the visceral organs is another potential space that in the embryo was a large space. And in the adult, it's a very small space, but the function is bigger than the structure. So it's a large space where the vata dosha, the excess energy of the nervous system can accumulate. The picture on the other side shows a similar, uh, this is a more of an oblique view. And that space would be seen on the bottom and the top of the diaphragm. So you get this prana accumulated there. You get this excess nervous energy from the nervous system accumulated there. <clears throat> we can take the picture down. And that accumulation prevents the normal function of prana. It prevents the normal function of the diaphragm. So when we're breathing in, we may feel a stop point. We may feel that the breath isn't really moving smoothly down. Well, what to do about that? <clears throat> Number one, don't worry about it. Don't get all excited and anxious about it. It's fine. <clears throat> it straightens itself out by bringing our awareness of normal function. Our awareness of normal function accentuates normal function. What we pay attention to gets stronger. So if you just listen for the perfect breath and watch the breath without trying to change it, you'll start to notice the breath will change on its own. And the breath will start to drop down lower and lower and lower on its own. It may take a little bit of time, but that's okay. Patience. So we acknowledge that there's a perfect breath. 
and we listen for it because listening is the most powerful of the senses. If you really want to understand anything, listen. Don't look, but listen. If you listen to nature, we understand the natural laws of healing. If we listen to the immune system, we understand what it needs. If we listen to our breath and listen for the perfect breath, the perfect breath will emerge. And we'll start to get this soft, sweet, subtle breath. And the breath will start to move lower and lower and lower until there is no stop point. There's no resistance. And this brings a harmonization to the five pranas. So the five pranas begin to function off a single fulcrum, a single intelligence. Now the prana that's moving down, a prana is harmoniously moving down and uprana, which is moving up, is harmoniously moving up. And this natural breath naturally leads our consciousness, our awareness into the cave of Brahman. So as the breath is moving down, the consciousness is moving up. And we call that a not normal conscious breath. So a normal conscious breath starts with a little widening of the transverse axis in the pelvis as the prana expands out, the diaphragm moves down, a prana moves down, the air flows, all of the five pranas are harmonized. And the consciousness easily moves into the cave of Brahman. And the function is activated. The consciousness expands. And we experience the essential truth of the cave of Brahman. This is a natural process. So the practitioner or the physician is only creating the circumstances for the natural to emerge. And the yogi, the same thing, the meditation practice, the sadhana, is just setting up the circumstances by which what is already naturally occurring can occur. So there's already a natural movement into the cave of Brahman, which is facilitated through a natural, normal, conscious breath. And we don't even have to find the normal, we just have to acknowledge it. We just have to acknowledge that there is a perfect breath. It's always there. Acknowledging that there's a perfect breath and listening, just listening for it. It will start to emerge. Those are some of the more essential things that the 
immune system needs silence, rest, love, a normal conscious breath. We can talk later about the nutrition, the supplements. We've taken a lot of time. Let's see if we have any questions. Thank you, Aline. So if you do have questions for Aline, you have the option of, of putting them in the chat and I'll, I'll read them off. I'll also allow you now to, un, um, let's see, because we have so many people, um, let's use the raise hand feature. So at the bottom of your screen, if you're on a laptop or a computer, you can find the reactions button. It's a little smiley face and you can choose to, to raise your hand. You can click on that and it'll have a little button that says raise hand. So you can do that and then I'll unmute you and you can ask your question to Aline. So I encourage anybody who has a question about anything that's been discussed to, to either type it in the chat or raise your hand um, now. And if there's no questions, we'll go on to supplements and nutrition. Okay, we'll move on to some things that can support the immune system from a standpoint of diet, <clears throat> supplements, herbs. I generally like herbs more than supplements <clears throat> because herbs are whole, they're not extracts. And as we talked about, the immune system uh, responds to wholeness. It functions off of wholeness, its whole perception is whole. Um, so herbs are, are wonderful ways to support the immune system. That being said, um, there is one supplement. Well, there's a few I'd like to talk about. One is uh, vitamin C. Uh, vitamin C is very commonly used uh, as an immune support, it's, you see it all over in the news and the literature, and it is very beneficial. I think the best form of vitamin C is liposomal vitamin C. And what that means is the vitamin C, which is a water soluble compound, has been suffused with a fat soluble compound, which is a liposome. And that makes it more permeable to the cell membrane, which means it's more easily absorbed by the cells. It also creates a little buffer, so it's not as acidic. But most importantly, it's more easily absorbed, so you don't have to take as much, which is a good thing. Vitamin C is essentially a sour taste. It's composed of sour. And most vitamin C, most potent vitamin C naturally occurring is usually in citrus fruits. You'll see a lot of vitamin C in citrus. And citrus, generally speaking, is a sour taste. And the sour taste is a combination of the earth and fire elements. The sour taste will tend to decrease the vata dosha, but it will tend to increase the... Uh, pitta, and in small amounts, the vitamin C will decrease kapha, but in higher amounts, the vitamin C will uh, increase kapha. So we want to be careful with vitamin C or too much sour taste. So the nice thing about liposomal vitamin C is 500 milligrams a day would suffice. <clears throat> you don't have to take high doses of thousands of milligrams. Because if you get too much sour taste, it will create an imbalance. The sour taste 
in small amounts supports a sharp mind, discrimination, comprehension. Every taste has an effect on the perception. So in small amounts, it'll bring a sharp mind to discrimination, comprehension, but an excess sour taste can lead to judgment and criticism and jealousy. So we want to be cautious with not too much sour taste. By liposomal vitamin C, 500 milligrams a day will support your immune system and be easily digested and keep your doshas in balance. Did somebody raise their hand? I thought I saw a question come up. Thank you, Vivian. I will um, ask you to unmute. You should be able to unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask your question. My question is, um, it's interesting because I am now in the process of, of craving silence. So what you said has very definitely hit home. But how do you block out the outside noise that you have no control over? Yeah, that's a beautiful question. <laughs> Great question. And I would say, don't block it out. And the reason I say that is coming back to how the immune system functions as wholeness. If you listen, we're listening to everything. And then we listen and we can listen for the silence that's holding all of that noise. There's a stillness and there's a silence that holds and supports every function. So even though there's a lot of noise and a lot of chaos, there is a silence behind it. And if we try to block it out, we're negating part of life. So we listen to the noise and the silence at the same time. And as we start to then pay a little bit more attention to the silence that comes to the foreground and the noise goes to the background. Some of the most uh, profound and beautiful osteopathic treatments that I've given are in a busy chaotic emergency room. And we really try to find the silence when we're giving an osteopathic treatment. We try to find the indwelling silence inside of the person in the stillness. So you have to ask, well, how could it be that such a beautiful treatment and such a powerful treatment happened in amongst all of this chaos of noise and people running around and screaming and yelling? It's by listening to the wholeness of life and not trying to block it out, but listen to that and the silence and acknowledging that there's a silence that's holding the noise. The essence of anything is not in the form, it's in the formless. So behind every form is an essence. And if we listen to that form, we'll come to the essence. Listen to all of it and the silence that's holding it. That's a beautiful question, Vivian. I crave the silence too. Thank you. More hands are going up. Yeah, is Isabella, um, I'll let you unmute yourself and ask your question now. Hi, thank you so much. Um, mm. I was wondering about, so when the breath is able to flow, easily past the diaphragm and, and there is no stop. Where does it go? Does it eventually stop at the bottom? The, <laughs> That's a beautiful or, question. Yeah. Or does, and then does it come back up? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> that depends upon the state of mind of the observer who's watching the breath. So, where the stop point is 
will tell you a lot about your physiology. It'll tell you a lot about how much sympathetic tone that you have in your body. If you have a high sympathetic tone, you're in fight or flight, you'll have a stop point at or above the diaphragm. But as the nervous system begins to harmonize and calm and settle, the stop point starts to go lower and lower into the lower abdomen in the umbilicus. And then we'll start to experience calmness. If you don't push it there, the mistake we often make is, oh, it feels so good. I'm gonna put my breath there. I'm gonna move my breath there with my willpower. This is more of an observing and an allowing and acknowledging that there's a perfect breath. So listening for the perfect breath allows it to emerge naturally. And the breath will start to slowly drop down lower and lower and you'll start to feel more peace and calm. Once it gets to around the area of the umbilicus and the belly button, it starts to feel really, really good. And the body starts to warm up a little bit because the pranas are all getting harmonized and flowing harmoniously through the entire body. Once it gets into the pelvis, it starts to become more and more and more transparent. And it begins to suffuse everything because it's actually now all of the pranas, the five pranas, udana, apana, pranavayu, all of the pranas have become harmonized as a single function and they're slowly diffusing through the whole body and passing through and out. So you'll hardly even perceive it, but you'll feel, you'll perceive something slowly passing from inside of you to the outside of you, coming off of the skin, and it begins to build the shelter around you. The shelter that in osteopathic medicine we call a fluid body, which is a pranic body. So you are actually then breathing in to creation your pranic or energetic body, and you'll feel this prana slowly coming off, diffusing through the skin, and moving out, out, out into nothingness. So it becomes everything. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. So the stop point goes away. There is no stop point. Yeah. At that level of consciousness, we, we become one. We become one with the ocean that we're living in. We become one with the environment. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have, a, I'll take a question from the chat and then we'll get to Lydia who has her hand raised. Uh, so from Rajani, she's asking, would using lemon or lime juice help with the vitamin C intake you were talking about? Yes, it does. Um, lemon and lime juice has a good amount of vitamin C. Um, but if you're trying to boost your vitamin C levels, you would probably have to drink more lemon and lime. Uh, if you were just using lemon and lime, you would probably have to drink more than would be of benefit for you. You may get too much sour taste with just lemon and lime. And that would start to increase the pitta dosha and that over time would increase the kapha dosha and would bring a little bit of imbalance to the mind. So you would lose some of the, the sharpness and the comprehension and you may start to feel a little bit more critical. You may experience more self-criticism or critical of other people from too much sour taste. One way to know what uh, taste is most missing in your diet is to use the 
uh, beautiful herbal formula, Trifala, the three flower remedy, also called the elixir of life. And if you take Trifala in the powder form, it has within it all of the six tastes. It's one of the only formulas that has all six tastes. And the taste that is most pronounced to you is the taste that's most missing at that time. It's beautiful. So if you take it and you get sour taste, you need a little more sour. If you take it and you get bitter taste, you need a little more bitter in your diet. If you take it and you get the sweet taste, you are perfectly balanced and you don't need any more trifola and you have a balanced uh, dosha and balanced diet. Sweet taste of trifola only comes when there's harmony and balance in the doshas. So if you need to boost your vitamin C, I recommend liposomal C. It's the easiest to digest and absorb, and you don't have to take high amounts of it. It's, it's because it's absorbed so easily. So 500 milligrams of liposomal would be like taking a couple thousand milligrams of regular vitamin C. Excellent. Yeah, Rajani says, thank you. Thank you. And Lydia, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question now. Yes, good afternoon. I really enjoy your talk. It's wonderful, very informative. Uh, so I actually have um, uh, questions about the dosage of vitamin C that you mentioned already and um, vitamin D. So I have actually here a liposomal uh, vitamin C, but it is at thousand milligrams. So if I were to take one pill let's say every third day, would that be sufficient or does that immediately disappear? Um, uh, uh, so um, how does it actually work with absorption? Uh, if I were to take more, since I happen to have this already here. Sure, so with absorption and mm -hmm. digestion, we have to recognize that there's gross digestion and subtle digestion, okay? Gross digestion assimilation occurs over uh, 12 to 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Vitamin C is water soluble, so excess will be eliminated easily on the gross digestion level. Mm -hmm. The subtle digestion occurs over 30 days. We'll talk about that at the next uh, program in January, but the subtle digestion is where you're going to see the effect on the mind as you break down the gross molecules into more and more subtle and refined energy and more and more refined prana, you're starting to feed all of the tissues, all of the datus and the subtle mind from the subtle aspect of the food. So you can do a couple of things if you're taking a little bit more vitamin C, you can take a little trifola and see if you're getting sour taste, you're okay. If you're getting a uh, bitter taste, it may be a little bit more than you need. You can also notice in the state of your mind, if your mind is sharp and you're comprehending well and you have good discrimination, then you have a good amount of sour. If you're noticing that you're a little more critical or jealous or judgmental, then maybe we want to evaluate that there's a little too much sour taste uh, going in at the subtle level of the digestion. The gross level won't be any problem. Any excess water-soluble vitamin, you'll pee it out. You'll eliminate it through the urine. No problem at all. It's the subtle level that we want to really pay attention to. What's the effect that the supplement, the herb or the food is having upon our mind in our consciousness, and that's a 30-day process. Okay, 
Um, and then the vitamin D. I also have here uh, an alternative doctor who, who has been uh, emphasizing a lot to take um, a high amount of vitamin D. Mm -hmm. And at my last blood test, I, I know the norm for a good vitamin D level um, would be 60 to 80, uh, but mine was 100. Mm -hmm. So at what time can this be toxic for your body? And how much vitamin D would you recommend? Right, so vitamin D, we have to be more cautious because it's a fat soluble vitamin. So it's not so easily eliminated in the urine like vitamin C. And so I usually aim for a level, as you're saying, of the 60 to 80 range. Mm -hmm. And if you're finding it's higher than that, then backing it down a little bit so mm -hmm. to avoid for vitamin D toxicity, which can build up in the fat molecules that will then affect the agni or the fire of the fat, which will affect the digestion and the immune system in the fat. And that's an essential process. Mm -hmm. So if you're up in the hundreds, maybe back it off the amount you're taking a little bit. Mm -hmm. Also with vitamin D, it's, it's a seasonal uh, effect because in the summertime, when we get more sunshine, we naturally uh, have more vitamin D in our system. And in the winter time, we have less vitamin D. So I will often adjust the dose based on the season. Higher dose in the winter and lower dose in the summer. But it's good to keep track. If you're taking a higher, higher doses of vitamin D, over 2,000 units a day, it's good to keep track of the levels. 2,000 units a day for most people is a safe level to take without having to monitor. Then you can take higher doses if you need to for a short time to boost immune system if there's a virus or COVID or an exposure to something, higher doses for a short time. But a day-to-day -day dosage, which is safe without monitoring, is about 2,000 units a day with food. Mm -hmm. Right now, I'm, I'm, I put it down already. Right now, I'm just taking like two or three pills of 125 units. So is that too low now? Not if you were that high. Okay. 2,000 units a day will generally maintain your levels during the winter. It won't raise them. It won't lower them for most people. But again, everybody digests and metabolizes a little differently. So we have to look at how the metabolism is of the fat cells of the individual, how the agni is behaving in the, in the uh, maja and uh, the meta datu, the fat, fat tissue. But generally speaking, 2000 units a day is uh, what will maintain you at your current levels in the winter time. Thank you very much. Uh, really yeah. appreciate your talk. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to take a question from the chat from Leo. Leo's asking, from your perspective as a doctor, how would you describe the different effects of bringing prana to the third ventricle versus the fontanelle? So the first thing is the prana is already naturally flowing. We don't have to bring it anywhere. It's already harmoniously uh, having a harmonious flow. What we would do is allow our consciousness to rest in the cave of Brahman and then allow the prana to move the consciousness where it wants to. Now, if you read the Vedic literature, there's six planes of consciousness from the cave of Brahman to the fontanelle. There's six planes of consciousness. And each plane has its own effect on the physiology, its own effect on the yogi and the consciousness. So the best thing to do is rest in the cave of Brahman and allow the consciousness to slowly rise up to where it wants to naturally be. And you'll experience these different states of consciousness, which will be beyond words, beyond anything that we can say. 
it's talked about, you can find it in different Vedic literature, these six levels, but better than reading about it, just know that there are six planes of consciousness from the cave of Brahman to the fontanelle. And each of those planes has an effect. Uh, one plane is, is a, a lot of fire and it burns away uh, ama, it burns away karma. And another plane is infinite space and another plane is infinite silence. So you'll experience these different attributes of the triple divine qualities. In one plane, divine light will be so bright, right? Many, many people who practice Kriya Yoga, when their eyes are closed and they're in the fontanelle, the light gets so bright, you think somebody turned the light on and you open your eyes and it's pitch black. So you're perceiving the uncreated light that's inside the cave of Brahman that is infinite space. These planes of consciousness are so beautiful Words can't even, can't even put to uh, do justice to it, but we don't have to pick one or do one. We just rest, we just rest in, the, in that area and the prana will naturally move you to where you need to be and where we will get the most benefit and the most communion with the divine and the beloved. It's a beautiful question, explore it rest in the fontanelle, rest in the cave of Brahman. Wherever you can most naturally rest is the place to be. And then the prana will move. It'll move you. Prana Krishna will move you exactly where you need to be, each and every one of us all the time. We have more questions from the chat, but we are, we're out of time. So I really encourage everybody to, to come to the next talk. I think it'll be in January. And um, I'll let Olin close us up with a few words. What we can do is um, uh, just make note of the questions and we'll try to uh, uh, tailor the talk to where our most questions are. And then we'll take more time for questions next time. So. Thank you everybody for your questions. We covered a lot of material. And uh, if there's any, uh, the, the essence of, of the lecture is the immune system is perception and the function is bigger than the, than the form. And we support the immune system through silence, through breath and through love. Rosa can end us with the prayer. Okay, thank you so much, Aline. Thank you thank for you sharing everybody. your time with us. Um, I bow to you, I bow to the lineage of Kriya Yoga Masters and all the saints and sages. Um, so as, as Guruji has encouraged us to do, we'll just chant the, um, the Maha Mrit Unjaya Mantra five times. I'll, I'll nervously lead. Um, and please chant along, uh, chant along with me. Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Sugam Deem Pushti Vardhanam Purvaruka Mibhavantanam Mrityur Mukshi Amamritat Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Sugam Deem Pushti Vardhanam Purvaruka Mibhavantanam Nityor Mokshi Amamritat Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Sugam Deem Pushti Vardhanam Purvaruka Mibhavantanam Mrityor Mokshi Amamritat Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Sugam Deem Pushti Vardhanam Purvaruka Mibhavantanam Mrityor Mokshi Amamritat Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Sugam Deem Pushti Vardhanam Urvaruka Mibhavantanam Mrityor Mokshi Amamritat Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank you, everybody. We'll send out a recording of this talk, and I really encourage everybody to come to the next one. The next offering, part two of um, Olin's lecture series, will be in, be in January. Is that right, Olin?
I believe so, January, yes. We're taking holidays off for December. And then we'll have monthly talk for some time in January, February, March, April. And we'll be, uh, we're putting together a program, Pranana is putting together a program, a meditation retreat uh, focused on health, healing, rejuvenation for five days uh, in March. We'll, details uh, will be coming shortly in March, April. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. See you next time.